all. And I trust that those who are joining us from home will also benefit from God's word this morning. My name is Eric Abuao, for those who may be here for the first time. And we are considering the attribute of God described in one of his names there in Exodus 34, 14, the God whose name is Jealous. And we are asking ourselves implications of that. And uh, hopefully as we go along, we will more and more see how privileged we are when we know God as he reveals himself by this name and how impoverished we become when we fail to know God as he has revealed himself by this name, Kana. Let us pray and seek God's help as we start. O oh Lord, we thank you. You've watched over us for these past days and allowed us to gather again and consider for a third time this very important attribute that you uh, possess that describes who you are, that you are a God who, whose name is Jealous. And we please pray that you'd help us to think your thoughts after you, protect us from being those who unwisely make God in our own image, and to realize that you are the one who is to make us. We are finite, you are infinite, and you are the creator, we are the creature. Help us therefore, Lord, to bow down at your feet with regards to the revelation you've given us in your word. And kindly grant that uh, we would flee to Christ and we would rejoice in Christ as we get to know you as described uh, in your word. We please ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we are back on this topic, looking at the attribute of God, the God whose name is Jealous. And uh, I would like us today to start by reading Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. Because many times jealousy has a combination of two things, desiring and deserving. And uh, as we read Revelation 4.11, we will ask ourselves, when God says he's a God whose name is Jealous, is he desiring something that he deserves? Or is he saying he deserves something that he desires at a primary level? It could be both, but we would especially want to compare that with weak and many times sinful human jealousy. Because one of the things that happens with this attribute is we struggle with it from a point of view of we are comparing jealousy as the as the sinful human tendency and thinking, no, uh, the holy God, the thrice holy God cannot be sinful. And so we struggle with, with that because we know many times when we are jealous, it is a sinful jealousy. There are times when we are indeed appropriately and rightly jealous, just like there are times when we are appropriately and rightly angry, even though more often than not, anger is, is a sinful behavior. So let's read Revelation 4.11. Revelation 4.11, God's word says, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed 
and were created. So, God is worthy. He is worthy to receive glory and honor and power. Then we are given the reason why. Number one, because he has created all things. By his will, they exist. And thirdly, for him, they were created. Does that make sense? So God is worthy to receive all glory, honor, and power because he is the only creator of all things. And all things exist because God does will them to exist. And thirdly, all things exist for him. They were created for him. And so when we think about God deserving and God desiring that all things glorify him to a point where if anything does not glorify him, anything does not honor him or ascribe to him worth, then he rightfully should be angry and he rightfully should act to ensure that that thing ascribes honor and glory to him or he does away with it because that particular thing, as we are seeing there in Revelation 4.11, was created for that very purpose of bringing honor and glory to God. So that when we are thinking about sinful human jealousy, many times it is because we think as human beings that we deserve whatever we desire. Isn't it? Or is it we... Yes, we, many times human jealousy is at this level. We think we deserve something simply because we desire it. But for God, when he desires something, it is because he deserves it. And if he fails to get that thing which he deserves and therefore rightly desires, he has a right to act in a way that would correct that situation. I just thought to start off from there to hopefully help us deal with that struggle we have, that chaotic struggle we have in our minds when we think about jealousy, a thing that more often than not when ascribed to human beings is sinful and yet we are saying God in Exodus 34, 14 calls himself the God who is not only jealous but whose name is jealous. What is the chief end of man? Do you want to help me? Good boy. Good boy, G. The microphone wasn't so loud. Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Scriptural texts that would support that. Thank you. 1 Corinthians 10.31, isn't it? 1 Corinthians 10.31 reminds us that whatever we do, whether we eat or drink, we do it for God's glory. If man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever, then we need to realize that it is okay for God to have it, and I say this as a finite human being, to have it as his chief end 
to be glorified, isn't it? And to be enjoyed forever. And where there is a variance there, he has a right. He has a right to act punitively against anyone or any creature that does not enjoy him and glorify him in all things. So hopefully that helps us to see that this attribute of God is one that when he says, I desire that you worship me, it is because he deserves it. It is not the kind of wrong, covetous uh, jealousy that many times human beings would have. Okay. Now we are saying this attribute is a privilege. It's a great privilege for us. And maybe we, we could go back to Exodus 34 and read that context again. We could read from verse 10. So last time we described what meeting this was and we talked about a number of things that marked out this meeting, sinful man that had been told, worship God and worship God alone, Exodus 20 verse 5 in the second commandment. But not long after that, they, they broke their quote-unquote marriage vow to the Lord by thinking they would worship the one true and living God using means or methods that are not allowed and which ultimately resulted in what such acts would always lead to, licentiousness, debauchery, and destruction of many. And so Moses goes up the mountain in verse 1 and uh, he's, he's given instructions to come back with tablets where the law is once more written and God describes himself as a covenant God. In verse 6, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for, th for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. And Moses does what's appropriate in verse 8. He bows down to the earth and worships and makes a petition to God, requesting that the Lord would be with them and be with them because without him they would be doomed to destruction. He says we are a stiff-necked people. He prays for forgiveness and he requests the Lord to take them up as his inheritance. And then God speaks in verse 10. Verse 10, Exodus 34, and, be, and he said, Behold, I am making a covenant. And we said last time, let's make a practice of when we see behold in Scripture, we appropriately slow down. Because when Scripture says behold, it's, it's asking you, slow down and see what I'm doing. Especially when we are privately reading, Behold is one of those ones that we quickly go through. And, be, and he said, Behold, I am making a covenant before all your people. I will do marvels such as have not been created in all the earth or in any nation. And all the people among whom you are shall see the work of of the Lord, for it is an awesome thing that I will do with you. Observe what I command you this day. 
Behold, I will drive out before you the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hevites, and the Jebusites. Take care, lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land which, to which you go, lest it become a snare in your midst. You shall tear down their altars and break their pillars and cut down their asherim. For you shall worship no other god, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. Lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and when they whore after their gods and sacrifice to their gods, and you are invited, you eat of his sacrifice, and take of their daughters for your sons, and their daughters whore after their gods, and make your sons whore after their gods. So we see in this context, as soon as God introduces himself as Kana, as the God whose name is Jealous, both before and after it, both in verse 13 and verse 15, the first thing he demands of them to deal with is no, no idolatry. That seems to be, from the text as I observe, the first thing they are told to do. He, in verse 12, tells them, don't make a, a covenant with the inhabitants of the land because they could become a snare to you. And he explains how they would become a snare in verse 15 and 16. He calls them in verse 13 to tear down the altars and break the pillars and cut down their asherim. Even in verse 14, before he, he reveals himself, before he discloses himself as a God whose name is Jealous, he talks about you shall worship no other God. Now let's therefore today talk about idolatry because it seems to me that to fail to know God as the God who has described himself as the God whose name is Jealous, would be to be most prone and to be most vulnerable to the sin of idolatry. The Apostle John in 1 John chapter 5, verse 21 in 1 John 5, 21, he sort of closing his message there. In 1 John 5, 21, with a plea to his dear children, and he says, little children, Keep yourselves from idols. I almost feel verse 12 here, which is saying, take care. Watch yourself. Guard, be on your guard, lest you be ensnared by idolatry. And... Looking at the language of take care or keep yourselves, I think we need to be very slow at assuming that I'm beyond being ensnared by idolatry. And today I would like to specifically look at three aspects of idolatry and I would like to invite us to to think about them
Let's think about pluralism, pragmatism, and syncretism. Okay? May I invite you, brethren, to help me explain what these are? What is pluralism? Yes, yes, Brother Paul. Thank you, Jamor. Yeah. Pluralism is where the idea that uh, your way of doing things and the way, my way of doing things are just as equal. And so, for example, in a pluralistic world, uh, always lead to God. Mm -hmm. Okay. Always lead to God. Okay. Evangelical inclusivism. Would, would, would that help us understand pluralism? There, there's plural there. Many ways to the same God. We are all worshipping God. You've heard that kind of thing said. Yes. So pluralism. How about pragmatism? Or would somebody like to add something on pluralism? They are just worshipping God also. Pluralism. Okay, pragmatism. Yes, yes, Brother Sitat. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> pragmatism is whereby if it works then uh, it's good uh, instead of basing it on truth whatever you, you're doing on truth is mm -hmm. you're basing it if, if this thing is uh, working right now yeah Okay. If it works, it's good. Thank you, Brother Sitati. Any other thing somebody would like to add on pragmatism? I've, I've added there, the end justifies the means. So if the end is this, whatever means you choose to achieve that end, you're okay with it? Yes, Brother Kahure. Behind that. It's the same thing, okay. Yes, give, please give Pastor Murungi the mic. I, I wanted to add the aspect of uh, selfishness in it. Uh, it's, not, it's not simply that if it works for us, but if it works for me. Okay. Yes. Wow, selfish. It works for me. Yes. How about syncretism? Yes. Please give, brother. Okay. I think is mixing both uh, Christianity and other things like cultures and all mm -hmm. those things. Mm -hmm. generally an attempt to amalgamate, to mix uh, various aspects of different religions. Now let's look again at the demand God is making here. He says, he's saying he demands exclusive worship. You shall worship no other God. And part of what is included here would, and we'll look at this hopefully next week when we are considering the regulative principle and uh, how 
God's revelation here does inform how we worship him. Some of that might come up today, but I think we need to realize that we are so prone to inclusivism, to pluralism, that thought that there are several ways to the same God. Mungu ni ni moja. We are all worshipping the same God, the Hindu, the the Buddhist, the Christian, the Muslim. But that's not the case. And there are people who may have some measure of influence today in our culture who sadly propose this kind of thought. This is not an uh, isolated thing. The thought that we have the freedom to worship the way we like is considerably entrenched today. And yet, the God whose name is jealous would describe serious consequences to anyone who goes the way of being pluralistic in their approach to God. Our almighty creator commands that we worship him alone and that we come to him through Jesus Christ alone. Any text that comes to mind that says pluralism is a no-no when it comes to worshiping the God of the Bible? Yes. Um, I will say uh, Ephesians three twelve. Ephesians three twelve. Okay, so it's speaking of Jesus, our Lord, in whom we have boldness and and access with confidence through our faith in him. Okay, I appreciate that. But what if somebody says he is one of the ways through whom we have boldness in accessing God's presence with confidence? How would we respond? What are the texts? Yes, Harvey, I'll come to you too. Uh, I can't remember exactly where, but Jesus says uh, of himself that I am the way. Oh, Carrie is telling me John 14, 14, 6. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Yeah, so he is very explicit, uh, explicitly claiming that he is the only way. There's no other way to mm. the Father. Thank you. Thank you, Have a John 14, 6. And one of the things, I'm coming to you, you could please give Brother Ebenezer the mic. One of the things that is important that, Harvey, you have missed out in that excerpt of Scripture is the conjunction and. He's not, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The and is repeated. I am the way and the truth and the life. They are conjoined. The implication is you won't have him as the life if you won't have him as the way and the truth. You won't say all I want from him is the way, the way to heaven, if he is not to you the truth and the life. Yes, yes, Brother Ebenezer. I'm thinking of First John chapter 5, uh, verse 11 and 12. Please, please repeat that. First John 5, 11 and 12. Okay. First John 5, 11 and 12. You could read it if you're there. And this is the testimony that God uh, gave us eternal life, and this is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life, whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. 
Okay. So it's, it's that, it's plain, there is no demilitarized zone. You either have the sun and therefore have life, or you don't have the sun and you don't have life. Okay. Any other? Yes, yes, Brother Luvisia. I'm thinking of First Timothy 2.5. Mm -hmm. It says... For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Mm. There is one God, there is one mediator, and it, the mediator is only Christ Jesus. No other mediator. Yes, Brother Sitati. Uh, Isaiah 44, mm -hmm. verse 6 says... Uh, Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the, light, uh, I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. Okay. So that talks about the exclusivity of God. And I appreciate that, Brother Sitati. But what we are addressing here is many times in inclusivism, people are saying, yes, there is one God. But there are many ways to that one God. So we are in agreement with Brother Sitati. There is one God and there is no other God besides this one God. So many people would be in agreement with that. But the way they conduct themselves would seem to be suggesting that one God can be worshipped or approached or dealt with safely using various methods. Yes, yes, Brother Paul. Acts, Brother Paul says Acts. Yeah, Acts 4.12, it says, uh, and there is salvation in no one else, and that's referring to Christ, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Mm -hmm. There is no other name. Now, given to men under heaven by which we must be saved. And so the false teaching of evangelical inclusivism is one which we do away with in light of our knowledge of who God has revealed himself to be and the purpose for which. Because in verse, he makes it clear in verse 10 that he is making a covenant with Israel, and it's not just for the purpose of Israel, it's for the whole world, that they would see God at work in them. So they can't blend in and still stand out. They've got to be those whom God is saying, I'm doing a work among you, a marvelous work, an awesome deed I'm about to do, and a kind of thing that has not been seen at all in any nation. And the people among whom you dwell shall see the work of the Lord, for it is an awesome thing that I will do with you. Listen to some respectable personalities who have talked about inclusivism. Tony Evans is asked the question as part of an interview on his book, Totally Saved. And he was asked the question about practicing Hindus being saved apart from Christ. And this was the question. The Hindus who are doing the best they can with the information they have. I'm talking about the and I'm talking about the Hindus who have never heard Jesus, never heard of the Savior, never heard of salvation in Christ, the only begotten Son. Can they be saved apart from Christ? And his answer was if they are not suppressing the truth in unrighteousness. To each Makata, Pastor Makata says, obviously there is no biblical defense for that. 
and Tony Evans does not attempt any such defense in his book. There isn't even a verse to defend that proposition. Because Tony Evans here is saying that living by natural light instead of special revelation, I'm using those terms which may be a bit complex because I hope you've been listening to Pastor Murungi as he preaches through the book of Romans, that we can come to salvation outside a knowledge of God as he has revealed himself in scripture. Let me quote Billy Graham, 1996. Billy Graham, I used to think that pagans in far off countries were lost, were going to hell, if they did not have the gospel of Jesus Christ preached to them. I no longer believe that. I believe there are other ways of recognizing the existence of God through nature, for instance, and plenty of other opportunities, therefore, of saying yes to God. Later on in Parade Magazine, that was 1978, in 1996 in Parade Magazine, Billy Graham would say, I respect other paths to God. Now, pluralism is a thing we must be very careful about. And there is a way in which these things are sort of like three intersecting circles. There is a point at which all these three things will, will intersect. So as we talk about pragmatism, for example, you'll see aspects of pragmatism that are also pluralistic or synchristic in nature. So let's talk about pragmatism. This tendency to say the end justifies the means, if it works for me, then it is okay. Uh, if, it, if it works, then it is good. What scripture would, would guide us against sinning against Elkanah through pragmatism. Or maybe let me put it this way. It may help with this particular one to think about various areas where today individuals and the church are sinning against God by being pragmatic. Yes, Brother Martin various areas where individuals or congregations are sinning against God by being pragmatic? Uh, I can give two examples. Mm -hmm. There are many. Mm -hmm. I think uh, the area of church leadership is one of them. Mm. Okay. What specific thing about church leadership? In terms of uh, the office, the church leaders, that the two offices... Uh, as we are, as the Bible talks about the elders and deacons, mm. they have they have added others. We find we have uh, reverends, we have bishops. In terms of hierarchy, okay, and then also in the area of of uh, congregational worship. Say something a bit about congregation or worship. That we can worship God. If, it, if this has worked for us, we can just come and jump and praise and sing in a way that uh, we, we, we like. Like uh, just standing there and, and one person, it's like a one-man show and okay. it works for us. And okay. it has been like that. So. This, this is how we worship in this church. Yes. And it works for us. Yeah. All right. What are the areas? Are we seeing pragmatism? Sorry. Uh, yes, yes, Brother Ken. Sorry, j just to add, uh, in church leadership, you see even the qualifications that are given in Scripture are uh, nullified, such that we, we are told that men are to lead, Yet, you see in other congregations, you see there are women pastors mm -hmm. here. Um, in other ways is that um, 
An another example is in, in what we have as the sinner's prayer, is that people are, are told that if you repeat this prayer, that you will be saved. Yet it is the work of God to lead, to bring the person to salvation. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Sitati and then Brother Paul. Uh, I think in the area of preaching, where um, uh, uh, an emphasis on expository preaching is not being done, and when you point that out, say people would say that for all these years we have been okay without having that kind of of preaching. I mean, this this has been working for us. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to add on that. Uh, organizing your church program and all that based on what is bound to bring in numbers rather than what is being faithful. And so uh, the gospel that is preached or for lack of a bit, it can't be called a gospel, but you remove all that is offensive to the human mind, uh, to the sinful heart, everything that humbles man, you remove it from the preaching and the practice so that people, you have more numbers. Uh, whereas the Bible would think of faithfulness as faithfulness to the scriptures. I mean, following Christ in that at his death, Though he had been followed by over a hundred, over over th by thousands of people, uh, he never once did anything to welcome them, uh, mm. unless they came the right way. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yes, brother Muirigi. Maybe uh, in Psalms fourteen, uh, verse one. Mm -hmm. The, uh, the psalmist says that the fool says in his heart there is no God. Mm -hmm. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is none who does what is good. Mm. And uh, we can see that uh, like the way we are being taught the other day, we are practical artists. Maybe sometimes we do things in our own understanding in such a way that it is like there is no God in our life. Mm. And uh, we, you see, uh, sometimes pragmatism is linked to our approach to solving problems and affairs of life. Uh, pragmatism is seen in? Uh, in Like approach to, okay. to solve problems okay. and affairs okay. in our lives. So, Sometimes we might solve the problems in a such a way that it is like there is no God. It is like a, that fool who says that the Psalm, Psalms 14 fool mm. who professes that there is no God. And mm. suddenly even as Christians sometimes, we can act in a such a way that it's like there is no God in our life. Okay. We are practically at the atheist. Mm. Uh, yeah. Mm. And that was a very helpful someone, yes? So that Pastor Murungi recently gave. Yeah. I'm thinking of missions. Missions. And so how we do missions in church, even though missions is a good thing, there's a certain way we might go about, say, raising funds so that we may attain that end which is uh, clearly opposed to uh, the scriptures. Okay. I think I could say a few things. There is, and we could go. Yes, yes, Pastor Murungi. I wanted to point out that uh, 
the problem of uh, pragmatism is very uh, ingrained in the 21st century mind. It's what is called the, it's called postmodernism. Um, and it's a philosophy behind some of the slogans that you see, you know, if you like it, crown it. Um, and basically put, it is the scene of being right in one's own eyes. Uh, what is condemned there in Proverbs 3, 7, be not wise in your own eyes, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Mm -hmm. uh, 12 verse 15, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man listens to advice. Um, and Isaiah does put it the most uh, strongly. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and shrewd in their own sight. Isaiah 5.21. Uh, and the point is that uh, um, when one is wise in his own eyes, thinking that if it works for me, then it's good. If it works for you, it's fine. You don't need to shove down my throat what you don't like. Let me choose my way. And that's what we would be dealing with today as we deal with the problem of homosexuality, mm -hmm. um, whereby, you know, one's feelings and emotions are elevated above the light of scripture mm -hmm. and the, even the light of nature, actually. Um, uh, and, and it's a problem that uh, is seen not just in the areas that you've identified, but in the basic way of thinking in post -mod, uh, in, in the 21st century, in, 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 in the philosophies that are being taught in school, uh, the worldviews that are being uh, propagated, it's basically that if it's right for you, then it's good for you. Mm -hmm. If it's right for me, it's good for me, and you don't need to question it. You, you, you shouldn't question it, even with uh, the light of God's word. Right. Yeah. Right. And so you'd see this play out a lot in, uh, in a number of areas, and we, we need to remind ourselves here about why we do certain things the way we do them. Because we... And, and if, if you're new to us, you could visit our website, check out our distinctive doctrines. Uh, they are all there. They are, they are uploaded there. Interact with us on concerns you may be having about why, why are you guys not doing what I think ought to be done because I've seen this being done everywhere. And, and by that we are not saying we have dotted all the I's and crossed all the T's. But there are a lot of things being done today in worship that are so entrenched at a macro level that one would be forgiven if they thought that such things have a biblical basis. And we can talk about, for example, the invitational system in evangelism, where the preacher preaches, and then at the end of it, with all eyes closed and with soft music playing at the background, people are told to lift up their hands. And if no one is lifting up their hand, the altar call is now combined with many things. It's not just those who want to repent their sins and come to Christ. It's also those who have problems and those who are sick. So that at least, I mean, in a congregation, there'll be somebody who has a problem. I do have a problem. If I'm going to be honest and we're told, if you have a problem, lift up your hand. Unless I want to lie in church, I do have a problem. Okay, and you hopefully do have areas where things are not perfect. And, and the altar call is now combined and people come in front and they repeat what has been called the sinner's prayer. But there is no biblical defense. Now, part of the argument would be, but God indeed does save people, has saved people, perhaps has saved me using that invitational system. Okay, now you see where pragmatism comes in. God saved me. 
And it was in that context of the invitational system. How do we respond to those kind of things? Do we have biblical verses that we go back to and check and ask ourselves, what would be my basis of agreeing with or disagreeing with somebody, say, who is using the invitation or system when they are seeking to do a good thing? The good thing here is preaching Christ, okay? They are not preaching the devil. They are not telling people run away from Christ. They may be very sincere, but they are at a level where they are saying, you guys are saying that, that scripture does not allow for, for female pastors. But when our, our lady pastor preaches, we are blessed and we see conversions. Help us to reconcile those two things. If it is wrong, why does it seem to be experiencing blessing? We are the fastest growing church in the city. And our pastor is a lady. Are you seeing where pragmatism comes in? We want to go for this mission in northern Kenya. And when we go, we will need resources. And therefore, it is okay to manipulate people and arm twist people and tell them, promise them blessings with certainty. I know there is somebody with 10,000. You know, that kind of thing. They are mobilizing funds in some cases for sinful purposes, but in some cases for a good cause. What do we do in such cases? What principle informs our decision making when we are faced with a situation where somebody is saying, give in a way that your right hand will know what your left hand is doing? And if you don't give that way, you risk being mistreated as one of those church members who is not participating in giving to the church because you are the only one who knows you're giving. No one else knows you're giving. Everyone else knows so-and-so gave this, so-and-so gave this. This guy, when we are giving offering, he's never standing up to come to the front and put the offering at the feet of them. Yeah. How do we deal with these things? What broad principles would guide us when we are faced with pragmatism? When you're, I'm coming to you, when you're faced with a situation where degree ni harambe, you know, you, you, you have this assignment you need to do in school and everyone is coping and you want to graduate this year and yet you don't want to copy. Or people go into the exam room and they have micro notes. And you want to graduate so that you can go to the mission field. You're not looking for graduation so that you get a big job. You want to be done with this thing so that you can go preach the gospel to the unreached people groups. Is it okay to copy? Brother Teka wants the microphone. What would inform your decision making? What would be, your, what would be informing you when you're faced with those situations where you're being told, sin so that you, you, you achieve some good end? Uh, for me, I think uh, the first place I will begin is this part of scripture, Deuteronomy 12 and verse 32. It's when uh, God is warning about uh, idolatry. And verse 32 says, everything that I command you, you shall be careful to do. You shall not add to it or take from it. Okay. So noticing that what God commands us in the scriptures, we shall do that. Therefore, doing everything in accordance to what God has commanded us. Not adding, not removing. Not adding, not removing. That's a helpful one. 
So you need to ask yourself, am I adding to or taking away from God's word? And if the answer is yes, you don't do it. At the end of the day, we all desire success, isn't it? But at the end of the day, when we look at, say, the parable, Matthew 25, the parable of the talents, they are told, well done, you good and faithful, isn't it? One would have thought, well done, good and successful servant would be the pronouncement at the finish line. But they are being told, well done, you good and faithful servant. We desire success. We want to see progress, especially progress with regards to, you know, being ambitious for God. We want to see more people going out into vocational ministry and see more church plans. We, we pray that we would fill up this place and have to deal with the stress of, do we create a second level here so that there are more people sitting at the top and others? We, we want those things. And it's not hard to humanly speaking, fill up this place and have three, four services a day because there is no space to carry everyone in one service. But we must remember, at the end of the day, it's well done, you good and faithful servant. Be faithful. If you are to choose between faithfulness and success in terms of results, you choose faithfulness and you leave the results to God. We, we strive for both, but our primary call is to plant and to water and to leave the results to God. Yes, yes, Pastor Murungi. Please give Pastor Murungi the microphone. Thank you. I just wanted to mention the illusion of... Uh, what seemingly works uh, for me, mm -hmm. um, or what is good. Mm. Um, what is good is not what you think is necessarily good, right. but what God says is good. It's good. And uh, um, what is good is his will, which is pleasing and perfect. Um, and, and also the... Um, the sufficiency of his word, uh, as Brother Teka said, you know, it's a word of God. It's all scripture that is breathed out by God and it's profitable for teaching, for correction, for rebuke, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent, that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Mm -hmm. So even though uh, human inventions and uh, uh, human imaginations may seemingly work and appear to bring good, yet its end uh, can only be good, not because of what human beings say, but, what, but on the basis of what God says mm -hmm. in his word. Mm -hmm. In other words, there are people who uh, the Lord does mention there in Matthew 7 who will turn up the last day and they would yeah. be just thumping and saying, yeah, we, we were servants of God. We preached uh, Christ. We preached the gospel. We, we kicked out demons. We did all these miracles. And uh, as I've said before, it's not that the Lord doesn't tell them. You know, the Lord doesn't tell them, no, you didn't. You didn't do miracles. You didn't kick out demons. Uh, he simply said, yeah, you may have done that. But really, the issue is that I never knew you. And even in your miracles and your exorcism, you are walking iniquity. Uh, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yes, there are two comments there. Uh, Victor, you could start. Uh, yes, I think I've noticed uh, a, beaut a very beautiful pattern uh, in the Old Testament. Uh, Joshua 24, 31, it says the Israelites followed, uh, sorry, served the Lord, and also they had known all the deeds of the works of the law, I mean the works of God. 
Deuteronomy again 11 says you shall love and serve the Lord and then he gives uh, the basis that uh, I am speaking to you and not your children who have seen and known the, lo the Lord, but I'm speaking to you who have seen his discipline, his greatness, his outstretching arm and his mighty hand. And so there's a beautiful pattern that I, I notice the Lord is put laying for this generation so that they're able to uh, read the book of the law, love it, and also do it. And in doing it, they'll prosper in all that they are doing, according to Joshua 1. So the first thing is God shows his great, great works to them. The parting of the sea, the plagues, the disciplines of those two guys who were swallowed by, and many other people were swallowed by the earth, uh, the, the parting of the Red Sea, the fall of the walls of Jericho, and so in his showing his works, uh, he shows an expression of his character, which is his greatness, his power, his love, his care for them, that is incomparable to any other God or any other being. And then these people are told, see, assert this truth, they're before you. And so in them seeing and asserting, Therefore, their heart believes, their heart uh, fears the Lord, and their heart becomes devoted to God. And then the last thing that you see is now them loving the Lord and serving the Lord. So Joshua reads the whole uh, book of the law. They, yes, they say amen. It is said in those times that they, they serve the Lord, they followed the Lord. And then in Judges, the opposite happens. They haven't seen, they haven't known. Uh, therefore, they abandon God, they forsake him, and they run to other gods. And so it's so, it's so beautiful the way uh, God set out this pattern for them, so that indeed they were able to uh, follow their patterns and, 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 and able to serve and also love the Lord. But it is so sad again, that's why you see how God was so angry. And the first generation that, uh, I think 20 years and above, the ones that... God, uh, in 40 years, they were all killed. And it is so interesting because they also saw the works of the Lord. They feared, but in the end, they did not believe. And so they forsook the Lord, and the punishment was wrath. And so to prevent us, even in our times, from following the idols that has been mentioned, it's so beautiful that Lord, the Lord has shown us his works in saving us, in giving us the Holy Spirit, in giving us the promise of inheritance, mm. uh, in, in the way he has said that he has given us power and strength and everything possible for life in this life here. And so we are called to believe in him, to follow through the scriptures, to be faithful to the scriptures, to be held by the Holy Spirit, so that indeed we are able to be faithful to the Lord and faithful to his commandments. Very close to what I wanted to say. So um, I would point to Luke 10, when the 72 disciples returned, Christ warned them in verse 20, nevertheless do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. And there is a great warning in looking at experiences there that um, we should rejoice that we have been faithful, that we are honoring God in what we're doing, not to look at, oh, the churches are being filled, oh, even people getting saved. Mm -hmm. And if we were saved through such means, we thank God that he used such means, finite means for, for our good, yet we know that it is what he has prescribed in his word. What we've been going through in Psalm 119, mm -hmm. verse 120 says, My flesh trembles for fear of you, and I'm afraid of your judgments. Mm -hmm. And verse, one, verse 96, I have seen a limit to all perfection, but your commandment is exceedingly broad. Mm -hmm. And that's like what Victor is saying, his word should be our guide, not looking at the experiences.
Thank you. Thank you, brothers and uh, sisters, for uh, your time this morning, for the thoughts you've shared. And uh, I think we can pause now. I'll, I'll start on syncretism, God willing, next Sunday, and uh, perhaps start from James chapter 4, verse uh, uh, 4 and 5, and see how uh, Scripture there warns us that... Uh, to love the world is to be at enmity with God. I wonder if your sermon per se has been uploaded on that section. I'm not so sure, but Pastor Murungi's sermons on the book of James have been uh, on the internet. So James 4.4 4 could be one that you could listen to uh, before, before we meet next time and discuss this attempt many times that we sadly fall for as if we are ignorant that God, the God whose name is Jealous, is keen on us prioritizing him, being intimate with him, and being faithful to him. And, and we amalgamate our traditions, especially by traditions I mean sinful traditions, with uh, Christianity. And, and this especially happens when we are celebrating or when we are going through difficulty. Those two extremes tend to be so wrought with syncretism. It's as if at that point I'm both a Christian and a person from this tribe. And we, we throw away uh, clear biblical standards. And uh, we succumb, melt at the threat of persecution from relatives who say you've, you've got to do things this way uh, or you take a flight. And, uh, and we don't draw the line on the sand because we fear man more than we fear God. And we, as we know God more and more as the God whose name is Jealous, we hopefully come to that place where we will do what he commands us to do uh, in verse 13. We are not just to run away from this, we are to confront this stuff. We are to tear down this kind of altars. It's not just defensive play that we are going to be involved in. It is offensive play. The Bible does tell us that Christ is building his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now we do know that gates do not attack, isn't it? So if the gate will not prevail against the church, it's because the church is attacking the gates of hell. The gates of hell are not attacking the church. It is the church going out to attack the gates of hell, and the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. And therefore, we need to appreciate that part of what we are to do here is not just to flee from this kind of sins, but to fight it. If you get to a place where somebody is arm-twisting people in the name of God to collect money, you don't participate in that ministry. You say, no, this is against Scripture. If somebody is arm-twisting people to come to the front, it's not just enough not to participate. It is proper for us to appropriately mention them by name and say, so-and-so is doing this and this is wrong. So-and-so is doing this, and this is not acceptable. This is a call to love God. And the Bible is very stern on this. Even in the New Testament, we are told, if anyone does not love God, let him be a cast, anathema. That's a serious thing there in Corinthians. A cast. Who here qualifies? Who here qualifies to escape from such a curse? It is no wonder then that Joshua says in Joshua 24, 19, we can't serve God. He is a God who is jealous. We must approach him through Christ. If you think you can dot all the I's and cross all the T's and be safe while neglecting John 14, 6, you are deceived. Put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as the only one who is the mediator between God and man. Let us pray. 
Oh Lord, there is so much to still say and listen to one another about concerning this topic and its implications on very ordinary aspects of our lives. The music we listen to, the talk we have, the friendships we entertain intimately, and such things. There are so many things with regards to implications on our prioritizing of the Lord's Day, our prioritizing appropriately of our relatives and friends in light of our love for you. Please help us. I feel like I've not even scratched the surface and yet the ramifications of what is before us is huge. Please help us, O oh Lord, not to go astray, but to know your truth and to obey it. Strengthen us for the rest of the day as we gather together to worship you. Help us, O oh Lord, to be those who would worship you in spirit and in truth. We please ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Please kindly interact over these things in between the services. Some of these things are hard. Some of you could be in very difficult situations right now and you need a fellow brother or sister to help you think biblically about loving God appropriately. Please interact in between the services. Interact over these things.